Thank you everyone for making it out here. Um, I'm super excited to be sitting with two people who are in the proverbial arena, building sort of the uh, building businesses in what I think is one of the most interesting categories of, of crypto businesses today, um, Deepins. And so um, we can kick things off with an introduction as soon as that goes out. But um, yeah, I'm Shion. I'm a partner on the investment team at Multicoin. I spend a lot of time looking at Deepin networks. Um, and we're going to have a good amount of time to kind of go into the basics and kind of dive into like broader mechanics and why they are only possible on Solana. Um, but I'll give uh, Paul and Noah a minute to introduce themselves and we'll, we'll jump right in. Cool. Hey, I'm Paul. I'm the founder of Teleport. Uh, Teleport is a rideshare application for an open protocol called the Rideshare Protocol. Uh, our goal is to uh, bring about a renaissance where there's more open protocols. If you think about things right now as they stand, you have email, you have the web, but then there's a lot of companies that have closed protocols. What that means for specifically rideshare, right now you might call a ride, you pay $59, the driver receives $16, because for a monopolist there's no incentive uh, to pay the driver more, right? If they charge the customer $20 more, the driver doesn't get $20 more, uh, so we do two things different. We're built on an open protocol. It's called the Rideshare Protocol. You can learn about it on trip.dev. Uh, that means there's real market competition in the system. And the second thing we do different is instead of spending billions of dollars on acquiring drivers and riders, we allow the drivers to invite each other. Uh, we call this proof of revenue. That means if you're bringing drivers and riders to the network, you balance supply and demand, uh, you are getting network rewards by the rideshare protocol. Uh, you can learn more about it on trip.dev, or you can go to teleport.xyz and download our app. We're in the iOS app store right now, and we're about to launch our first city in the United States uh, early next year. Any alpha on which city? Uh, there's a, we're, we're probably going to run a competition between different places, because what you need to launch a city is you need an atomic network of enough drivers, enough riders. You're not going to have a good experience if there's one driver. Uh, but actually, you need about one driver per square mile. So if you think about a place like San Francisco, I used to live there for 10 years, that's about 46 drivers. Cruise had like 50 drivers with their self-driving cars. That doesn't sound like as big of a number. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're working out the exact details, but it's probably going to be an invite competition. And if you want to get ahead on that, uh, you can download the app right now. You can start inviting people. And if your city is the first city where we get enough people, your city is going to launch first. Nice. Very nice. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Noah Prince. I'm the head of protocol engineering at Helium Foundation. Uh, so Helium is probably one of the first deep end projects. I don't know if we were the first, but it's got to be close. Um, You're the first. In, you, you, you can say it. You can wear it yeah, like we as can, a badge. We can call first. Yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, we were so early that uh, we had to build our own L1. Um, but Helium was this idea that um, founders wanted to coat the world in internet coverage. Uh, and you know, similar to most deep ends, that kind of has a chicken and egg problem of nobody wants to use a network that doesn't have coverage. Um, but you know, you've got to get the coverage first. Um, so in a kind of similar way to teleport, uh, anybody can just go buy commodity hardware. They can buy hotspots and basically become their own cell phone tower. Um, and so you do that, you mine tokens, and then anybody can use it for now a variety of things. Helium has become more than just one network. It's actually a network of networks. So um, there's a mobile 5G everything plan in Miami for only $5 a month, which is insane. Um, but also the lowest or the uh, highest coverage lower on network in the entire world, uh, which is used to power everything from smart cities to smart farms, uh, you know, basically everything in the Internet of Things space. It's five dollars a month. I pay like seventy, eighty dollars a month from Verizon. How do you do the five dollars a month? <laughs> I know it's like insane, but. Yeah, I've actually talked to people who work at these telcos and like the, the way that they have to go about deploying things is super inefficient, especially for something like 5G where like your range is really low. For every single one they deploy, they have to go like negotiate with a landlord 
to like get some like square on their rooftop and then they have to send somebody out there to put it up there. They have to have a legal team to write up the legal contracts to like lease that land for however long. Um, and you know, they also have an oligopoly so they can charge whatever they want. But it's also like, it's also very expensive for them versus like the landlord just sees like, oh, hey, Helium is this really, really cool thing online. And like, I'm already paying for internet. I'm already paying for electricity. I just plug it in. Um, super easy. Yeah, um, that's amazing. So we're, we're, we're going to get into all that. We have a good amount of time here. So I think it's good to start with just sort of table stakes around what deepens are. Um, I think the general idea for those of you who are not super familiar, these are physical infrastructure networks that are built out using token incentives across kind of distributed cohorts of people who are um, purchasing or, or, or building out infrastructure in different parts of the world and being rewarded for their contributions to a global network um, through tokens, right? And I think in a time where there are always questions about like what crypto is useful for, what is uniquely enabled by this sort of primitive, this, this permissionless money, um, I think Deepens present a very compelling answer to things that are net new. And you look at the sort of businesses that, that Paul and, and, and Noah are building, um, you know, Helium's going after massive telcos with, with huge regulatory capture, massive amounts of, um, you know, legal, like strength in the market as it stands today. You guys are going after the Ubers of the world and the, the massive taxi unions that are, you know, aggregated and disaggregated in, in, in you know, really interesting ways, but they're both behemoths in their, in their own right, right? And as sort of, you know, early stage teams, depending on how you define early stage, right? Going after these markets is, is a very non-trivial thing, right? And, and I think core to that is, is token incentives, right? Like your businesses would not be possible without blockchains, right? Um, so could you, I think, I think maybe it's helpful to, to, to start with, you know, what tokens have, have done for you and, and how you see them sort of playing a role in, 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 in what you're building. Um, and how you think of that sort of capital formation mechanism as a whole um, in, in terms of what, what is uniquely enabled by, by the model itself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a real David and Goliath situation <laughs> with these giant companies, but it's not really like David with a single sling. It's like hundreds of thousands of Davids with slings throwing rocks at Goliath, right? Like it's, and that's, that's what tokens enable, right? You could surely have people deploy hotspots and then just pay them in, in USDC. But at that point, they have absolutely no ownership in the network. And that's not really fair. Um, the other thing about these is the person who deploys the very, very first hotspot is taking a lot more risk than the person who deploys, say, the millionth hotspot. Because when you've deployed the millionth hotspot, there's coverage all around the world. There's very likely to be people that are using the network. But when you deploy that first hotspot, like, nobody knows that anybody's going to use the network because it doesn't have the coverage right now. Um, and so tokens, they level this playing field. Um, and, you know, specifically Helium works on a, a halvening schedule. So, like, the people who built the network early had more incentive to do so and take that risk on. And that kind of a, enables a flywheel that allows these networks to get built incredibly fast. In fact, I don't know if I've ever seen a hardware rollout as widely successful as Helium's IoT network. I mean, it's just, and it, it's like not just in the US, it's like literally everywhere. If you look at a coverage map, it's just like green as far as the eye can see. Um, I've just not in my life seen anything else I can do that in like a short period of time. Yeah, I think the civilization as a whole, right, is coordinating people to do things together. It doesn't, it's not, you know, one person doing one thing. Civilization is a multiplayer game at heart. And to build anything that's big and able to, there's, there's a great essay, I, I know many of you probably have read this essay about, you know, the pencil. Like how hard it is to make a single pencil. How much of, you know, like you need to go out, you need to find the graphite, you need to refine it, the coloring, all the refinement, the tools to cut down, the tools to mine for, for the materials you need. Like a single person, maybe in a couple of decades they could make a pencil. Instead, we make them for dirt cheap all the time. So civilization is about coordination. And uh, I think at various points in society, we come up with new tools to coordinate better, and it allows us to achieve bigger, bigger things. 
We're also developing new materials. Those new materials allow us to uh, build specific machines or to build specific things. But the underlying substrate of civilization is the ability to coordinate. I think why we are all here and why there's such a large movement in crypto right now is because people have realized some of our institutions have started failing us. They're not working as efficient as they could be. And you know, we, we, we can question the things. We can look at that in private industry. We can look at that in, at it in, in government, in other parts. But you know, it's this question, does, did, does DocuSign need 7,000 engineers to make a software where you can basically, you know, enter your name and make a digital signature? Do you need 7,000 people for that? Does Uber need 33,000 employees and $2.5 billion a year in fixed cost just to finance their operations? And that's only 20% of their total cost. 80% of the cost is variable. So you end up with this really weird situation where a driver who works for a living to you know, feed his family, pay rent, uh, send his kids to college, uh, that driver on a $59 ride makes $16 quite often. But you can ask yourself, is this the most efficient way to organize a society? And I think we're reaching the point where the answer is no. But to get change, we need to coordinate people. Because if I propose a more, a better solution to run this, everyone's going to be yes, but all the users are already on this existing solution. No one's ever going to switch over. And partially the reason why we believe this so strongly is because of a marketing campaign by venture capitalists and founders during the first dot-com bubble where Everyone was saying first mover advantage, network effects, Metcalfe's law, you know, basically the first to come along and do something, you can never unseat them. The question I want to propose is, is that actually true? Because Netflix started only 12 years after Blockbuster, and it actually managed to unseat them very quickly. It's about 13-ish years after Uber Cab, as it was initially called, Uber started giving rides in San Francisco, and Uber has become the new taxi industry, right? And it's, it's not good for the drivers, it's not good for the riders, I think we can unseat them. So I think with Helium, with Teleport, and I think we're gonna see a lot more deep in protocols, we already see a lot of them, Shion probably knows a lot of them uh, popping up, there's really an opportunity to do away with this myth that Companies that don't serve their customers have an indefensible mode. I think there's a defensible mode as long as humans can coordinate and you can reward the early adopters who make the transition. We're turning that step function, everyone needs to switch at once, into the early adopters get rewarded and it becomes a gradient. So let's, so let's dive into that, Paul. I mean, you paint this super idealistic version of the world, which I, I'm, I'm, a super fully, I'm fully on board with, and so, so let's, let's get into it. Um, you know, counter-positioning against this sort of behemoth, centralized incumbent, the big bad rent-seeking Ubers of the world in, in whatever categories, right? Where yeah. you have this sort of central pricing model, a lack of flexibility, a lack of ownership, a lack of general alignment across yeah. the people who are providing, you know, the, the thing that's valuable to the network, the car and the driver, right? And, and them sort of sitting out of the equation and being limited in, in their options for what they can get out of that. You you know, sort of with your open wide arms and saying, come to me, we'll, we'll fix this, right? Um, we've seen people try to compete with, with, uh, with a business like Uber, you know, 100 times over the last 10 yes. years. Um, there are sort of, you know, certain things that people have in mind around like what it takes to, to do that correctly and, yes. and, and, and certain sort of minimum thresholds in terms of a service that needs to be provided sustainably, right? In your head, what are those, what are those components? Like what do you need to get right in order to um, start taking them on directly? And, and what are the things that you think about in designing your business that allow you to counter position against, against that business? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, uh it's easy to become cynical when something has been tried many times, uh, but it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means you don't understand how it's going to work sometimes. Not for everything, obviously, 
But I think, I think of the world kind of as like this big puzzle of where you have to figure out the order in which things happen, right? Like when does something get cheap enough? What's the effect of having, you know, like a, a gyroscope in every phone suddenly that makes, they, they get really cheap. Now you have drones, right? Like, like we wouldn't have drones if we hadn't had cell phones first, right? So, so in, in a lot of, we wouldn't have AI to the same degree if we hadn't had cheap use for like video games first. Right. It's really interesting to kind of un, untangle this puzzle. But when a bunch of things get ready, there's this period of usually a couple of years where people don't understand that something dramatic has shifted and then suddenly something crazy happens, right? This happened. I like to go to history. I love reading about history because you see all these examples, right? When the Mongol Empire invented accounting, they became large because they could manage a large empire because they invented the accounting system. So I think what has happened when Satoshi uncovered one, how to build a decentralized protocol, he didn't only uncover how to build a decentralized protocol, he also found a way to reward the early adopters. And that's, that's this transition function. What you need is a good idea of a more, of a better end state people can believe in, and then you need a way to coordinate human behavior so that selfish interest and the interest of having a better system for the community is aligned. And then when you have lots of actors, and I'm a distributed systems engineer by trade, right? I, I used to work at Dropbox. I built their peer-to-peer -peer protocol. I'm an engineer. And what I realized is what you do in distributed systems in peer-to-peer -peer protocol design, in agent-based modeling, you think about how do you get emergent behavior on the level of like a, a cloud of actors that emerges from the selfish behavior of the individuals. And so coordination is essentially just setting incentives and rewards where I can achieve a goal of unlocking a city and then receiving rewards because we are the first city in the world where teleport is live. The drivers get paid more, the riders pay less, and the early adopters in that city get all the rewards. It's like almost like you're the only city in the world where you can mine Bitcoin. It's like Hal Finney, Satoshi, and you in your city. Every other city in the world is suddenly gonna think, oh shit, why does city X, no, the question was good, which is the first city, but that's the question going to be, why does that city, why is that the only place where I can currently get these network rewards from the ride share protocol? And they're going to push hard to coordinate locally to launch the next city. Once we have two cities launched, oh my god, this can go very, very fast. And that's just like what you've seen with Helium. These things go slow, 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 and then they explode. Yep. Slowly, then all at once. Yep. It's actually been fun to watch it happen in Miami. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that coordination problem that you described, Paul, is at the heart of every single one of these businesses, right? Yep. Like, that's, that's truly what is... is so, sort of programmatically changing in, in, in the structure of these businesses. Um, I mean, Helium, for instance, right? Like, it started off as this IoT coverage network for LoRaWAN, right? Like, low range, kind of, these are sort of dog collars and sensors. The, the, the type of signal, the type of network that was being built out to prove that capital formation mechanism um, was for a very specific use case. Um, having transitioned to 5G and mobile coverage now, right? You had to take that core principle, but build it on top of the same network, right? Like it's it's still HNT as an asset, and there are some you know it's not easy moving from a specific type of coverage to now a, a full open protocol to define you know net new forms of coverage, whether it's it's Wi-Fi or cellular or or, or 5G or whatever it is, right? Noah, how has that you know how, how has that transition been over the last two years as as mobile and and 5G have come on? You know, moving the core stakeholder base away from that initial hotspot owner in early 2018, 19, you know, setting up 20 hotspots in their city and mining these tokens, all the way to kind of picking up small cells and, and, and establishing them in like strategic parts of a city and, and providing coverage. Um, what has that transition been like? How have you had to manage incentives across that network with different forms of hardware, different networks? Um, what has that process been like over the last couple of years? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because you know, when you think about how you deploy a, a 5G network, it is just completely different than a lower one network. So, like, um, for people not, like, familiar with these things, lower one is this super, super far range, low power signal 
Um, so like, you know, these, these hotspots can go 10 kilometers, but people have even seen them go hundreds of kilometers. Um, and sensors that are using these networks um, are really low powered. So you can have a sensor on your farm that lasts for like 10 years. If you were to try and, you know, put like a, you know, mobile phone battery in that and like have it connect to the mobile network, it might last a week. Um, and so like the deployment for these is you can truly like get coverage everywhere, but you don't need 40 hotspots in one place. You, you want them really kind of well distributed. Um, and then 5G is like almost the opposite of this, right? Like uh, Helium Mobile just recently came out with Wi-Fi hotspots and you know from your homes, like Wi-Fi hotspots have a pretty short range. Um, but the idea is that most of the people who are using the networks are in these highly populated areas. They're in a sports stadium, they're in a shopping mall, they're at the cafe. And so you want to concentrate coverage in these areas because you have kind of a limited range. Um, and so, you know, that's been kind of one of the bigger transitions. And so we've started to see really cool innovations come out of this, like this thing called hex boosting, which is a really cool name, but it basically just means, hey, like if you go deploy in this area where we know there are tons of people using the network, you're going to earn a lot more tokens. And then kind of seeing as you like, create these incentive structures, um, how humanity just kind of rallies around it. Like, it's not like we're going and like hiring someone to deploy it. It's just like some guy and he's like, actually, I know a bunch of people at this like university. I know a few of the like, cafe owners and I can go get them to deploy a hotspot. And I also know a bunch of students that will pay, you know, will be willing to do $5 a month for this plan because like it's expensive existing nowadays. Um, and Helium is kind of doing it all. Uh, and the, you know, the engineering and the tokenomics behind it is also just, has been super crazy because you kind of go from the system of one, two tokens, if you consider like data credits a token, uh, to, you know, now we have, you know, three tokens plus data credits, that's four. Um, and then, you know, we took the old L1 and shoved it into Solana, and so now you have Sol. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of pushing the bounds of, of the way people understand crypto. Um, because like, you know, a lot of these people, it's their first time in crypto and you're like, not just one token, but there's like five. <laughs> um, so that, you know, that's been, you know, the problem that we're working on, but it is, it's still very much working and it's cool to see how these two different networks operate very differently, but it's still the same idea. Yeah, so let's get into that. I think we've established at this point that these businesses are only possible with crypto. Let's talk about why they're only possible on Solana, right? Like, let's, 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 let's try, you know, with, with Helium, there was, like you mentioned, the original H&T token, and then there were data credits. And now there's mobile, there's IoT, there's potentially net new tokens. How does all of this stuff come together? And I want you to tell the story about how you got involved with Helium in the first place and how that initial build out started as well, because that structure and that incentive mechanism and the scale at which it's happening seems to be only possible on Solana. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, uh, last year was really interesting. <laughs> um, so originally I, was, I founded a company on Solana uh, called Strata. Um, we built a product called Wumbo, which was like, you know, involved with social tokens. And as one usually does with startups, you kind of like end up pivoting back asswards into like what you probably should have been building. Um, and so like we realized in building social tokens that we actually just made something to make it really, really easy to launch tokens in general. Um, and we had come up with a, a unique way of doing bonding curves um, such that the, the prices weren't so static. You could actually have the amount of tokens in supply, uh, some of them get burned, for example, uh, and the price would actually adjust. Um, and so like, I'm sure you're thinking, what does this have to do with Helium? Um, Helium actually had a very similar mechanism that they wanted to use for um, how the subdial tokens relate to the main token. Like you have to have some kind of bonding between, between these two uh, things. So there's like a little bit of overlap with Strata. And then, you know, Helium was trying to do something insane that no one had ever done. I still remember like the first call, they're like, we're going to shove a blockchain into another blockchain. It's like, you're, you're, doing, you're doing what now? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I started in October. We did the migration in like April, 
which is just absurd. The timeline on this was crazy. Um, and like, the other kind of cool thing that happened with this was, uh, you know, you talk about only possible on Solana. There were a lot of things that were just like too hard to build on the old L1. Like, there's just, you know, enshrining something in L1 is a lot harder than enshrining it in smart contracts, obviously. Um, so there were all these like grand lofty ideas. It's, it's, if you've never looked at the Helium Improvement Proposals repository, the HIPs, they're, they're great and they're so detailed and it's basically like a history of the network and all of the decisions. And there's just like a backlog of like, here are all these like amazing ideas that we want to implement. We want these sub networks, we want V token voting, we want this, we want that. And it was like, we'll just wait till Solata, we'll wait till Solata and then we'll build it all. <laughs> Um, and we, we did. We actually managed to get like most of these things out the door by the migration, and then the rest of it probably within the next like the following three months. Uh, it was just like an insane engineering effort. Like multiple organizations, Helium Foundation. There's Nova Labs. There's like dozens and dozens of manufacturers that build these hotspots. Like the coordination on this was just insane. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it really speaks to sort of the limitations and the constraints of the tech as, you know, in, in other configurations of how you would build these systems and, and how, how you can kind of get around some of that through basic primitives on, on Solana that have already been built, right? Um, I think when I talk to a lot of people who are building consumer products in crypto, um, you know, I'm, I'm always the guy in the corner shouting, Deepin is consumer. Your stakeholders are, you know, regular people, right? Your supply side, your demand side, these are, you know, people who in some cases don't need to know that they're interacting with the chain. And so you want to make that as simple, as, as smooth, as fast, as cheap as possible. And if you're rolling your own configuration, you're rolling your own stack, you're, you know, dealing with new forms of abstracting away all of the stuff that's behind the chain, you want to have primitives that you know, make that easy, right? And so, I mean, in, in your case, Paul, you know, your stakeholders are, are, you know, drivers and riders, right? These are not people who... In, in some cases, want to know what tokens are. They don't want to handle keys. They don't want to handle custody. Like, how do you think about designing an application that is, you know, that, that crypto and tokens are so core to, and yet messaging that and, and making sure that it's accessible to a cohort of people that, you know, may, may not want to have anything to do with them, but, you know, still need, still understand the, the merits and the value behind the system. Yeah, you no, know, it's, it's, not, it's, not it's not an easy thing. I think if we... For the longest time, you know, for the longest time, you couldn't build on crypto because crypto didn't exist, right? Like, like there was proof that the Byzantine general's problem couldn't be solved. You can't reach agreement in de decentralized systems. Satoshi solved that. That kind of kicked us off with proof of work. Uh, so many interesting uh, results have come from that, like in, in, in not just in cryptography, but in economics and so many... Uh, different areas, but uh, I think where we're at now is technology is not the problem. You can actually build really cool stuff. And I sometimes hear people complain, you know, oh, Rust is hard and this and that. But, you know, people used to write games in machine code or, you know, in directly, like, arcade consoles, not even in, in circuits, right? Like, if, if tech is your problem, you don't have a problem. So the interesting thing now becomes, like, it's true, though, right? That's a great take. <laughs> If, if tech is your problem, you don't have a problem at this point. So now the question actually becomes a little bit more, what do you actually, how do you get users? How do you make it user friendly? And my background actually, I, th I think the reason I'm doing this, you know, I worked on consumer products. I built Austria's largest food delivery company and sold it uh, before coming to the States. I worked on Dropbox, was employee 11 over there. And we did two things right. We built, uh, a product that was better than anything out there, competing with the giants. Steve Jobs wanted to buy us, and I remember Drew Houston coming, you know, to the team, and we were working late. So, like after a whole day at the Apple campus, he told us he turned him down. That was insane. Uh, I worked on the peer-to-peer -peer protocol over there. This was uh, 2010, and uh, I've worked on crypto early on, and so I've kind of been like in in the wait, there was a consumer. By the way. Dropbox was a consumer application that was really, really good, really hidden from the user. We were trying to have almost no interaction. We injected code into the running Mac Finder because it didn't have an API for making like icon overlays. Really good product. 
but no one would have ever heard about us unless we also did another thing. We invented two gigabyte for you, Drew, Drew invented two gigabyte for you, two gigabyte for me if I invite people. So I think what's lacking in crypto and what Satoshi was not lacking is this coordination mechanism of rewarding people who actually bring users to the system. Distribution, distribution, distribution. The product was better than anything out there. Google Drive didn't even make it out of the door for the longest time. They're going to name the competitors of the time because no one's going to remember their names anyway. Dropbox slaughtered that space. Uh, I think what's necessary when I think about this, I need easy onboarding. Ride sharing is fantastic because you can pay with credit card for a ride, which means onboarding, but I can still give the driver USDC. The driver is already background checked. Now we can actually withdraw with that background check uh, to his bank account. Or he can spend with Solana Pay, and I know a lot of people here are working on this. So we're onboarding potentially hundreds of millions of people into the Solana ecosystem, right? So that's one part. For that to be possible, we can't have high transaction fees. Things need to be fast. Um, so I see our job as mass onboarding people into Solana. And then also you have to think about rideshare, according to McKinsey, might be an 800 billion a year revenue industry. Other estimates are like around 280, 300 billion. So let's be conservative, say 300 billion a year. That's almost. Bitcoin's entire market cap every year going through rideshare. Now imagine that getting onboarded and being transactions with something like Circle USDC on the Solana network. That could be the beginning of turning Solana into the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. I mean, that, that's just one protocol for one function, right? That, that's just one thing. That's what we're building. Other people, you all will build other things. I think that's very powerful. And also the composability of all of that that is possible. If there's one protocol like that, I think we have to change our notion of what money or value exchange actually is. Because if that's cheap and composable, and no one wants to be paid in, I don't know, tomato futures, and all I have is, let's say, Apple stock, as long as there's someone who can provide liquidity to translate that, he doesn't even need to know I pay using Apple stock and he receives uh, tomato futures. <laughs> so this is the future I see. We're building on Solana because I think composability matters, speed matters, price matters, and having high availability of all the infrastructure, like uh, really cheap NFTs with the compressed NFTs and, and state compression matters, having the highest USDC or stablecoin uh, liquidity outside of Ethereum, which is too expensive to build on, higher than any of the Ethereum L2s. So, so that's what led us to build on Solana. It's just a really good ecosystem. But if we bring this to Solana, it also means for us, other people can then build Solana Pay. Other people can build things like Phoenix and you know all the like Orca, Jupiter, like all the other AMMs and, and order books. So for, to us, that is exciting to bring liquidity to something that we can then build on top of with other people. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's permissionless financial markets for net new forms of value, yep. right? And and with with access that is completely unrestricted. It's a it's a really appealing vision. I think the composability of this is going to get really interesting, right? Like we're you're effectively making humans more useful because like with a lot of the things in DeepN are are kind of. You're already like you were already doing that, right? Like you were already paying for internet, and you already had electricity, so you put up a hotspot. Yeah. But like you were already driving for teleport, earning tokens, and you put a hive map or dash cam in your car, and now you're mapping the road, and you're just like earning tokens for that. Now you're more useful. But even then, you could have your mobile phone in your pocket that's on the Helium mobile plan that's mapping the network and telling Helium where they should be deploying hotspots. You get tokens for that too. Um, you could, like throw a demo in your car and be earning tokens for that too. And then these things start to compose together because I'm going to like take the tokens that I earned on Teleport and now use them to pay for my phone plan on Helium. It's just like the world's going to be really, really crazy in like 10 years. Totally. I mean, I mean, I think, Paul, I think the Dropbox example is super pertinent, right? Like the, sort of the defining feature of these platforms, these marketplaces to give away value as an exercise in user acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. And historically, that's been in the form of credits or coupons or, you know, it's, it's sort of 
proxy, you know, it's value, but it's never ownership, right? You, it, it's never stake, right? Like yes. that's, that's, never, that's never really been possible to deliver. And that's kind of the unlock that a lot of these networks offer. And I think one of the emergent things around that is that you now have, you know, two million people in the world who hold HNT, who have earned this and mined this and part of it. That's a community. That's a, that's a net new people. That's a coalition. Yeah. Um, that's a network state, quote unquote, in some ways. Yeah, but we, 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 we can get into that later. But how do you how do you think of kind of that kind of softer social layer, right? Like these are these are part owners in your business. They are in some ways on your cap table, right? Like they are the, the, these are and then they should be because they are, they are providing the the value there, right? How do you think of community? What sort of primitives, you know, crypto primitives specifically, do you do you use to coordinate things within this, the the community itself? And what, what is the value of having kind of this, you know, this distributed set of stakeholders that is um, owning and running this business that you are also creating? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the guys on the previous panel were, you know, speaking a lot to this, but like the, the social consensus layer is extremely important. Um, you, you know, Helium didn't just go from like a single network to a network of networks in a vacuum. The community voted. Helium is probably one of the biggest DAOs, and so with that we see you know, some of the largest kind of coordination problems. Like DAO tooling is a, is a really, really hard problem. And like, how do you get, you know, people to turn out to vote is something that we're, we're really thinking hard about. Um, Helium has really, really good participation for a DAO. But when you think about like how many people go vote in the United States, a lot of times it's like 40, 50%, which we see that and we're like, oh my God, half the people aren't voting. But I see that and I'm like, oh my God, half the people are voting. <laughs> um, and like, their DAOs are nowhere close to that, um, which is a problem, right? Because then it becomes easier to, you know, maliciously take over a vote. Um, and so, you know, we're looking from a technology perspective at a lot of things. Um, recursive delegation is, is potentially interesting. I, I delegate to my friend because he knows more about Helium and then he delegates to you know, Chris, because Chris knows everything about Helium. Um, that kind of thing can maybe help voter turnout, um, radically decreasing the cost to vote, which, you know, already on Solana, it's a lot cheaper. You know, I think on the Helium L1, it was like 30 cents to vote. Um, on Solana, it's way cheaper. But like, I'm thinking like, how can I make it free? Like, how can I use generic account compression to make it just free to vote? Um, and then things like confidential voting, which are like incredibly complicated too. Like, are people not voting because they're scared people are going to see what they voted for? Um, you know, all these things are, you know, we are super, super focused on how we get more people to vote because these are, you know, this community, you can maybe call it like dog fooding or your customers, but they're not really customers, they're your community. And like, the more feedback you get from them, the better the network is going to be because. Who knows best what the network needs other than like the people that are doing it. Um, so yeah, very excited about the kind of governance side of things. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree. That that part is extremely interesting to me. And I kind of see it as like as a as a lab. I mean People, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you don't see it, but we're literally building some of the infrastructure that other people are building on top of to build civilization, right? I mean, it, that, that's what we're doing here. I know that's very, you know, patting ourselves on the back, but, you know, other people, you know, they work on hardware, and I think that's really impressive. That's not what I do. What we do here is we work on the incentives that build a cohesive civilization that allow other people to build hardware, right? You need different, that's what humans do. We specialize in different parts. But these incentives and these tools and voting technology, that's big. And I think, I, I mean, you know, like I want to go and just, there is technology like voting, but there's things like hoard or organize a society, like, you know, what the founding fathers did, uh, accounting systems, writing, all of these tools are ways to coordinate us and they make a difference. And I think people, crypto goes through its cycles and some people are only there during the fair weather. I think we're getting back into a fair weather period, but really, you know, whether fair weather or bear market, you, we're building something that is actually going to deeply, deeply matter here. That's my take on it. So a lot of what you guys have built is 
out in the wild today, right? It's, it's live, it's the market, people are playing around with it. What does the world look like in 12 and 36 months? The ideal state of the world for, for both your networks. Just, just paint, paint an idealistic picture for uh, us. 12 to 16 months, what I, what I want to be, get built. <laughs> uh, a lot of stuff. I want everything I just mentioned about governance, um, I want to completely uh, decentralize the system. One of the very hard things about Helium that I don't think most people realize is like the, the scale at which it's operating is, you know, it's kind of like an AWS scale. Like you've got like hundreds of thousands of hotspots and like millions of sensors, all of them like screaming into, not the void, screaming into real things that are collecting that data and deciding how we're going to reward people. Um, tons of people on phones. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge amount of data. It's enough that you know, the fire hose obviously like, was breaking our L1, which is why we moved to Solana. But in doing that, uh, you know, things like packet routing had to get moved off chain. And so I would love to see that stuff um, completely decentralized. Rewards, calculations, completely decentralized. Like, how do you solve these big data problems in a completely decentralized way? Um, so I want to see that. I obviously want to see uh, you know, the Helium mobile rollout go just completely nationwide. And just like, I, I really want to make like a map of this so you can see uh, you know, in a sped up timeline like all of these deployers coming out of nowhere and deploying these wireless hotspots where people are using it. It's going to be like watching a board. It's going to be really cool. Um, so yeah, 12, that's like 12 to you know, 24 months will be interesting. Um, you know, you talk like 10, 20 years, I'm really interested to see what happens when we hit like the mint burn equilibrium point. Just uh, since we're running out of time, I want to launch cities and I want people to copy what we're doing and start new protocols based on the principles of the right share protocol, read the white paper, trip.dev, and copy what we're doing, build more protocols, let's decentralize more protocols. Amazing. I feel like we could be here for another 40 minutes, guys. But thanks so much for the time. Thank you. Okay,